for him who will pity the poor. Often people build wealth through usury. What's usury? It's exorbitant interest. Loan sharking would be our sort of idea. An extortion or blackmail. People take advantage of people and they make lots of money in doing it. He says, he who does that will only gather for him who pities the poor. Solomon made the same uh, observation later on in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Job does the same thing in Job 27. Job said this, This is the portion of a wicked man with God, and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those who survive him shall be buried in death, and the widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust, and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. <clears throat> In God's observations of life, this is how it works out. People who take advantage of other people to make wealth end up losing it. It goes, up, goes to somebody who will use it for the right purposes. God in his providence does that. Those who are not faithful with what he entrusted them will lose it. And those who are faithful will receive all the more. Why? Because they take care of the poor. It doesn't really matter how much you make a year. You have to understand this, that the money you make, you didn't make. God hasn't given that to you just for you. He's also given it to you so you could take care of the poor, the disadvantaged, the needy. Not the guy who needs new leather seats in his BMW, but the person who legitimately needs. And so every time that you're out there on Main Street or down in the mall, or even in this neighborhood, there's plenty of poor people around here. You just look for them. And they are an opportunity to be faithful with what God has entrusted to you. Is that challenging? It's the truth. Take advantage of the opportunities. Verse 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. One who turns his ear away from hearing the law. I can't tell you how many times I've counseled with somebody, or I'm witness, witnessing to somebody, and they say to me, well, I, I gave God a chance once. I prayed, I asked him. He didn't give me that girl to marry. I didn't get that big contract at work. I prayed that he would, this is a true story. Many times I've heard this. I prayed he'd keep me out of prison. I still went. And you think, well, I'm not surprised. You didn't want anything to do with God. You want nothing to do with God. You want nothing to do with His Word. You don't want to give control of your life over to Him, but you want Him to, to run around and save you of all, deliver all good things into your hands? Really? It says, He who turns His ear from hearing the law, even His prayer is abomination. The word abomination here, as I've stated before, means something disgusting. God finds it disgusting. People who would try to use him as a means to their ends. I dare say that it should be the other way around. We should be used for his ends. But sometimes we get it backwards. People get it backwards and they think that God is sort of on their puppet strings and they can just do this and they say these right words and they do these things and give to the bishop's fund and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, everything's just going to come your way. It doesn't happen that way. If you want God to hear you, then maybe we should first listen to him. Amen? That's the truth. Again, it's a priority issue here. Verse 10. Whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he himself will fall into his own pit. But the blameless will inherit good. Now, how do you lead the upright to go astray? You have to think about that. But it's not too difficult to put somebody in a very tempting situation and watch them fall, is it? It's really easy to start a conversation that sounds like, you know, hey, have you noticed so-and-so? And then you just hope that they'll come back with a little criticism or something like that. Kind of baiting the hook. Happens all the time. And the person who does that, we read, will fall to his own pit. 
If you're that kind of person that likes to start the conversation and hope the gossip comes back, guess what? You're going to be the person who gets gossiped about. You're going to be the person who gets criticized. But the blameless will inherit good. The blameless. Not the perfect. How many of you are perfect? Just Corey. Good. <laughs> we'll play along with that one. Okay? But how many of you are blameless? Are you in Christ? Sin's been atoned for. You are blameless before him. You're not perfect. He understands that. And there's a good inheritance for you. So for heaven's sake, understanding this, the inheritance that you have in front of you, now live worthy of it. Don't, you know, try to avoid sin so you have an inheritance. Understand you have an inheritance already and let that be the motivation for you to live right and to live well. Verse 11. <clears throat> Verse 11. The rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding searches him out. <coughs> the rich man is wise in his own eyes. Often wealthy people consider themselves quite smart, in tune with the world's ways, because they have worldly success. They made lots of money. They got fame, whatever it happens to be. And they think they know all about how this world works. You think about presidential elections coming up a year from now. And there's all kinds of celebrity endorsements. All kinds of celebrities are going to get on television. They're going to tell you how you should vote, or who you should vote for, or what you should feel about an issue. Why? Do I really care what Brad Pitt thinks about the third world? Does he live in the third world? Maybe he took a trip there and got a couple photo ops. But should I really care what he thinks? Or how about, uh, well, this, one, this one just inflamed me. Lady Gaga telling people that they should be covered through the Affordable Care Act. Obamacare. Lady Gaga telling people they should be covered. I'm thinking she should cover herself. <laughs> how ironic. But for some reason, society has this idea that somehow if you've made lots of money, or you've, you've got fame, or you've got a book contract, or you know, you're television pilot made it on some network or something that somehow we should listen to you about your ideas in life because you're so smart. But here's the problem. Wealth blinds people. It's not that wealth is bad, but the confidence in wealth blinds people. And they don't see their own ignorance. They just see, hey, I'm doing well, therefore I must understand all things. But the poor who has understanding, searches him out. That's a poor man. He sits apart from wealth. He sits typically apart from pride. Usually when you're poor, you don't have a lot to be proud about. You can say, look at all my great accomplishments. I'm penniless, right? I mean... <laughs> so sitting apart from that, he has a more objective view. He searches him out. That's, he knows what that guy is really all about. Again, the issue isn't wealth, it's confidence in wealth. And as I've stated before, you know, wealth is just a relative thing, isn't it? It just depends on where you live. <clears throat> True story, and I'm not saying this so that you'll pity me in any way. But according to the United States government, I live just below poverty scale. Has anybody here ever been in my house? Thank you. I mean, if I, if I live in poverty, I'm doing pretty good compared to most people, I'm thinking. And even if you live in the Section 8 housing down the street, let me tell you something, you live a whole lot better than most of the people in this world. What is wealth exactly? This is all relative kind of stuff. This is the true thing about the wealthy and the poor. We're all one step away from death. One breath away from death. Nothing changes that. We're all helpless before God. And all the money in the world can't change that. Verse 12. 
When the righteous rejoice, there is great glory, but when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. We've seen this a couple of times in the Proverbs already. But the word rejoice here means, <coughs> excuse me, means to jump for joy. When the righteous jump for joy, there is great glory. But when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. See, there's two, type, two different people both rising. One in rejoicing and one rising to power. When the wicked arise, men hide themselves. Two different people, both rising, two different results. Back in Proverbs 14, we read this. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We think about this country was highly exalted. Why? Because it sought righteousness. Never was perfect, you understand that. Right? Settlements began in Virginia, 16, no, no, excuse me, Pilgrim, 1620. Slaves arrived in Virginia in 1619. There's always been a double standard. But the common man sought righteousness. The pulpits were aflame with men who preached righteousness. And today, you don't see so much of that anymore, do you? We want to gather big churches with lots of lights and tell cute little stories and give the people an emotional experience and say, voila, you've touched God. When the wicked arise, men hide themselves. It's a sad statement, but it's true. Again, for a nation that's falling, God gives <coughs> the prescription, if my people. We're called by my name. He's not talking to Hollywood. He's not talking to the Billboard magazine representatives. He's not talking to Washington, D.C. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their cry from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. Well, who's he laid on? Us. Us. Verse 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's a challenging proverb. Covering your sin does not bring prosperity. Ask Adam and Eve. Fig leaves are not comfortable. They're kind of scratchy. We tend to bury our sin because of our pride. We know what we're really about. We don't want other people to know what we're really about. But to bury your sin and not deal with it, not confess it, it's, it's not going to prosper your life. It's going to cause you problems. The problem is that sin has a way of unburying itself. It's kind of like a zombie. It keeps coming back all the time. You bury it, but you know. Like Moses said to the Israelites, be sure your sin will find you out. It's going to come back to you. I told you about the, the guy who brought his zombie girlfriend home to meet his mother. His mother looked at the girl and said, where'd you dig her up? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's an old joke, but it just seemed to fit right there. I didn't have any dumb jokes for tonight. I had to throw something in somewhere. <clears throat> but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I like this. Not just confess your sin, but forsake it. That's called repentance. Not just saying, I'm sorry I did this. It's to forsake it. That is to turn your back on it. Move in the other direction. That guy will find mercy. 1 John chapter 1. Let's run up front to there. 1 John 1. We'll just read verses 5 through 9. Our older brother, John the Apostle, writes this. He says, This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you 
that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is what John is saying. Live in the light. Don't bury your sin. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. It's not there. It does. If you say you have no sin, you're a liar. We all sin. We all blow it. Let's just get that out in the open. He says if you'll confess your sins and forsake them, there'll be mercy in your life. Now, I'm not saying that you should take a laundry list of your sins and post them on Facebook so that everybody can read and some will click like and some will throw some comments out there or something like that. But live in the light. And I'm going to encourage you. Everybody has some area in their life that they need to, to really protect themselves. For you guys, get a couple of brothers that you can trust and you can confide in. We'll help hold you accountable. Man up. Sundays, 2 p.m. Live in the light. Don't bury this thing in shame. Confess it in humility. Let some brothers know. Not everybody. Be discreet, of course. Ladies, same with you. Don't go to man up, of course. <laughs> but find a couple of sisters who are weighty in the spiritual things that are discreet and have tight lips. And help have them hold you accountable. My board of directors, when we started the church, said, hey, we want this. We want to be able to come to you and say, how are you doing right now? We want absolute truth. And if we can do that, we can be on your board. It's a blessing. It forces you to live in the light. Verse 14. Wow, we've really got to move. We're going to finish the chapter tonight, huh? <laughs> Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Happy is the man. Oh, how blessed is the man who is always reverent, who has a healthy respect for God and for authority given by